It was on Maiden's Day in the year 130 AC that the citadel of Old Town sent forth 300 white ravens to herald the coming of winter. But Mushroom and Septon used to disagree that it was high summer for Queen Rhaenyra Targaryen. Despite the dissatisfaction of the King's Landers, the city and crown were hers. Most importantly, the Iron Throne was hers, and she had several hostages of value to King Aegon, her half-brother. Across the narrow sea, the hierarchy of the three daughters had begun to tear itself to pieces once again. The waves and the narrow sea belonged to House Valarian, and thus the Iron Throne. Those snows had closed the passes through the Mountains of the Moon. The Maiden of the Vale, Lady Jane Arryn, had proven true to her word, sending men by sea to join the Queen's host. Other fleets brought warriors from White Harbour, led by Lord Manderley's own sons, Merrick and Torrin. On every hand, Queen Rhaenyra's power swelled, whilst King Aegon's dwindled. It was now that many began to question if there was even much of a war left to be fought, but you should never celebrate before the last foe has fallen, as no war can be counted as one whilst foes remain. The Kingmaker Sir Criston Cole had been brought down, but somewhere in the Seven Kingdoms, Aegon, the King Sir Criston had made, remained alive and free, surely hatching and scheming a plan to try and regain the Iron Throne from his half-sister. Aegon's young daughter, seen by some as his heir, Jehera, was likewise at large, somewhere in the Seven Kingdoms. Laris Strong, the clubfoot, the most enigmatic and cunning member of the Green Council, would have vanished too. Storm's End was still held by Lord Boris Baratheon, no friend of Queen Rhaenyra. The Lannisters had been counted amongst Rhaenyra's enemies as well, though with Lord Jason dead, the greater part of the power of House Lannister was slain or scattered at the fish feed, and the Red Kraken hiring Fair Isle on the western shores. Castle Rock was in considerable disarray and struggling to keep control of their own domain. Prince Aemond, had become the terror of the trident, descending from the sky to rain fire and death upon the riverlands, then vanishing, only to strike again the next day, fifty leagues away, with no rhyme or reason to his choices. His choice of targets seemed random, be it a village or a lord's castle, Vagar's flames reduced Old Willow and White Willow to ash, and Hog Hall to Blackstone. At Merry Down Dell, thirty men and three hundred sheep died by dragon flame. The Kinslayer, then returned unexpectedly to Harrenhal, where he burned every wooden structure in the castle. Six knights and two score men at arms perished, trying to slay the, his dragon, whilst Lady Sabbath of Frey only saved herself from the flames by hiding in a privy. She fled back to the twins soon after, but her prized captive, the witch, Alice Rivers, escaped with Prince Aemond. That day, Vagar's flames melted and twisted the ruins of Harrenhal a little bit more. As word of these attacks spread over the realm, other lords looked skywards in fear, wondering who might be next. Even small folk began to abandon their villages, hiding in the forests and caves of the Riverlands. Lord Mooden of Maidenpool, Lady Darkland of Duskendale, and Lord Blackwood of Raventree sent urgent messages to the Queen, begging her to send them dragons to defend their holdings. Yet, the greatest threat to Rhaenyra's reign was not Aemond One-Eye, but his younger brother, Prince Daron the Daring, and the great southern army led by Lord Ormond Hightower. Hightower's host had crossed the Manda at Bitterbridge, but was slowly advancing due to its size. But moving on King's Landing it was, smashing the Queen's loyalists wherever and whenever they encountered them along the way, and forcing every lord who bent the knee to add to their strength. Flying to Serian ahead of the main column, Prince Daron proved an invaluable scout, warning Lord Ormond of every enemy movement. Often as not, the Queen's men would melt away at the first glimpse of the dragon's wings. Grand Maester Munkin tells us that the southern host numbered more than 20,000 as it crept upriver, almost a tenth of them mounted knights. Very aware of all these threats closing in, Queen Rhaenyra's hand, old Lord Corlys Velaryon, suggested to her grace that the time had come to talk. He urged the Queen to offer pardons to Lord Baratheon, Hightower and Lannister if they would bend their knee, swear fealty and offer hostages to the Iron Throne. The Sea Snake proposed to let the Faith take charge of Dowager Queen Alicent and Queen Helena so they might spend the remainder of their lives in prayer and contemplation. Helena's daughter by Aegon, Jehera, could be made his own ward and in due time be married to Prince Aegon the Younger, binding the two halves of House Targaryen together once again. As plans go, it made sense. And what of my half-brothers? Rhaenyra demanded. When the sea snake put this plan before her, what of this false king Aegon and the kinslayer Aemon? Would you have me pardon them as well? They stole my throne and slew my sons. Spare them and send them to the wall. 
Lord Corliss answered. Let them take the black and live out their lives as men of the Night's Watch, bound by sacred vows. What are vows to Oathbreakers? Rhaenyra demanded. Their vows did not trouble them when they took my throne. Prince Daemon echoed the Queen's misgivings. Giving pardon to rebels and traitors only sows the seed for a fresh rebellion, he insisted. The war will end when the heads of these traitors are mounted on spikes above the King's Gate, and not before. While his tone seemed extreme, to some extent Daemon was correct. If Aegon or his brother lived, there would still be those who would name them kings. Aegon II would be found in time, hiding under some rock, but they could and should bring war to Aemond and Daron. The Lannisters and Baratheons should be destroyed as well, so their lands and castles might be given to the men who had proven more loyal. Grant Storm's End to Ulf White and Castle Rock to Hard Hugh, the prince proposed, much to the horror of the Sea Snake. Half the lords in Westeros loyal to us will turn against us if we are so cruel as to destroy two such ancient and noble houses, Lord Corliss said. It fell to the Queen herself to choose between her consort and her hand. Rhaenyra decided to steer a middle course. She would send envoys to Storm's End and Castle Rock, offering fair terms and pardons, but only after she put an end to the usurper's brothers, who were in the field against her. Once dead, the rest will bend the knee, slay their dragons, mount their heads upon the walls of my throne room, let men look upon them in the years to come, that they might know the cost of treason. <laughs>